we started our radical small group study this week. And it's going to be a challenging study. I think it already has challenged those that were here on Wednesday. After we watched the, the video on Wednesday, I asked everybody, do you still want to do this? Because there was, some, there was some tough stuff in that video, wasn't there? It was a little difficult for us to, to hear. Convicting in many ways. But with that small group study, the study kit came some sermon outlines to coincide with each of the weekly lessons. Um, I've never followed someone else's sermon outlines before, but I wanted to give it a try with this series. Now, keep in mind, it's not a sermon, it's a sermon outline, not a full sermon. I'm not just up here reading someone else's words. So you still get the Pastor Mike flavor for the sermon today. Hopefully that's your thing. So for the next six weeks, we're going to follow this radical series and starting this week with radical abandonment. So if you have your Bible with you, I do encourage you to keep it open to Luke chapter 9 as we go through everything today. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. So Jesus asked his disciples two questions here. First, who do the crowds say I am? Remember, it isn't just the 12 that are following Jesus. There are literally thousands and thousands of people that are following and listening to what Jesus has to say. We know this for one example uh, because we have the miracles that Jesus performs when he feeds these large crowds. Jesus feeds a crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He feeds a crowd of 4,000 with seven loaves and a few small fish. Thousands, probably tens of thousands of people are following Jesus in some way. Some are certainly more devoted to Jesus than others are. So who do the crowds think that Jesus is? Some think he's John the Baptist. They're not really sure, but some think maybe he's John the Baptist. Maybe he's Elijah. Maybe he's one of the prophets. I don't know. Maybe this guy works for Kentucky Fried Bread, Fish, and Chicken. I don't know. <laughs> KFBFC. They may not know who Jesus is, but they know that if they follow him, they can get something out of it. Some of them, not all of them, of course, but some of them are simply looking to have their stomachs filled. That's what the crowds are thinking. But then Jesus turns to those closest to him and asks, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. Peter knew who Jesus was. In Matthew's gospel, Peter says a little bit more and Jesus gives us a little bit more of an, an, an idea as to where that information came from. In Matthew chapter 16, but what about you, he asked, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And it's a question we need to answer ourselves. Who do we think Jesus is? I think most of us here this morning, we would probably believe, we would probably echo what Peter says. That Jesus is God's Messiah, that he is the son of the living God. And I can stand up here and I can tell you who Jesus is. I can tell you who I believe Jesus is. But ultimately, though, it must be revealed to you by God as to who Jesus is. That's belief. But of course, there are possibilities out there. There are different ideas in the world, in the crowd, still floating around today as to who Jesus is. We've explored some of these ideas in our Comparative Religion Sunday School over the last couple of months. To some people, Jesus is a prophet, but no more. To others, Jesus is a good man, a smart man, a wise man. To some people, he is a God, a small g God, but not the God. 
To some, Jesus is a teacher. To others, Jesus is an extremist. So in order for us to evangelize, it's important for us to know what the crowds of today think about Jesus. But right now, we're going to focus on who we think Jesus is and how we live our life reflecting that belief. So it's a decision each of us must make. Something each of us needs to declare. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he simply a prophet to you? Is he a man with a lot of really great lessons, but that's about it? Is he an incredible teacher, but no more? Or is he God's Messiah? Is he the son of the living God? Is he your Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? If he is, if you said, yes, Jesus is my Lord, yes, Jesus is my Savior, then there is a way that you must live your life. It is a life of total devotion to Christ. Back in Luke chapter 9, now verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. On Wednesday, David Platt in the video that we watched talked about crucifixion. He talked about um, why someone would carry their cross. What is the only time that one would carry their cross? It's if you are going to die. It's the only time somebody would carry their cross. Think a little bit about that first century context of the crucifixion. It isn't just about the death of that person that's carrying the cross. It's about a lot more. Think about what Jesus did. They put the cross on him. He's walking through the streets of Jerusalem. The crowds see him. What do the crowds think of this guy carrying a cross? What is their immediate assumption? He's a criminal. Yes. Yes. Carrying that cross to Golgotha, in Jesus' case, is designed to be humiliating to the person. It's designed to be an embarrassment to that person. So he carries the cross through the city, up to Golgotha. He's then crucified, and, he, and Jesus, along with the, the other two on either side, are left there. And depending on what the situation is, who's being crucified. Sometimes they're left up there for a few hours. Sometimes it's days. Why are they left up there like that? Again, to humiliate the person, but also why else? A reminder, a warning to the other people. Look at what's happening to this guy. If you mess with us, the same thing's going to happen to you. It's a warning. It's a reminder to the other people. The only time you are going to pick up your cross, carry your cross, is if you are going to die. In Jesus' time, you do not want to find yourself carrying your cross. It's the last thing you ever want to have happen to you because as we've already said, you are on your way to death if you are a humiliating, torturous death. But Jesus says you must carry your cross daily. When Jesus says you must deny yourself, you must die to your own wants, your own desires, die to your old life, and live for Christ. The only reason you carry your cross is because you are already dead. And Paul echoes this in Galatians in one place. I preached on this passage a couple months ago. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Also in Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. 
The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If we die to our old self, if we take up our cross and carry it to death, if we die to old self, then what must happen? We must be reborn in Christ Jesus. John 3.3 3 says this, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Yes. I think the born again term is kind of muddled in, in the modern world. But the truth is every person, every person that wishes to follow Jesus must be born again. We must die to our old self and be reborn with Christ Jesus. How often must we carry our cross? Daily. daily. We must pick it up daily, Jesus says. Now, Jesus only died once, right? One time. His act on the cross was enough to atone for all of our sins. He doesn't need to die once for you, and once for you, once for you, once for you, once for me. He doesn't need to do it again and again and again and again and again. One time was enough for all of our sins to be forgiven. If we die to self and are born again in Christ Jesus. Christ's death once was enough for all. One act for our salvation. Do we need to be resaved over and over and over again? No. Once we're saved, we're, we're saved. Assuming we're truly saved at that point. I've been baptized a couple times, but that doesn't make me extra saved. Many of us have been baptized more than once in different traditions. Why then would Jesus say, take up your cross daily? Why do we have to be reminded to die every day to self? Well, I believe it's a way to help us live the way we should live. Are you a mature Christ follower the moment you start following Jesus? Just instantly, I follow Jesus, boom, I know everything? No, of course not. It takes time to become a mature Christ follower. As we've talked about before, you can be saved in a moment, but then you spend the rest of your life maturing in Christ. Now, I wouldn't be talking today about total abandonment, radical abandonment of self, if it was acceptable to use the idea of maturing, lasting a lifetime as an excuse to not live a life fully committed to Jesus today. Does that statement make sense? It takes time to mature, but we can't use that as an excuse to not do what we need to do today. We need to wake up every morning, remind ourselves that we have died to self, that we are carrying our cross and living completely for Jesus. It is a daily struggle because we are tempted by the ungodly things around us. One of the biggest problems in Western Christianity or American Christianity, it seems, is that we have this idea that we can simply incorporate Jesus into what we already do. We can take the life that we are currently living and then simply add Jesus to it. We treat Jesus like a seasoning. Many of you have been around when I've, I've baked that really simple bread and we've auctioned them off. I call it my $40 bread because last time we did this, we went down to Texas. Uh, I baked four loaves, of course, during worship. So we were all smelling fresh baked bread during worship, which was, it was, well, it was kind of mean when you think about it. But we auctioned them off and, and the people that, that bought them gave a total of $160 for four loaves of bread. That's like... A dollar fourteen worth of stuff in those four loaves of bread, and, and people were so generous. I know it wasn't buying the bread; it was giving to the mission. But anyway, that bread that I make, it's so simple, but you can add some things to it. Every once in a while, when I make one of those, I'll add some garlic and parmesan. Make a garlic parmesan loaf; it's really good. I know a lot of people I've heard have put like seeds and nuts in this bread because the bread itself is a really good base for it. You can add some seasoning to it. We do that with a lot of food, don't we? If I make a ham steak at home, put a little Frank's Red Hot on there, a little seasoning, 
to my food. But we must not treat Jesus as a seasoning on our life. We must not treat Jesus as a seasoning on our life. I'm not saying quit your job and devote your life to full-time ministry. Now, maybe God's calling you to do that. I'm not sure. You, you need to listen to God for that, for that word. But live your life in the context of what Jesus says. Instead of trying to fit Jesus into the context of your life. Do you understand the difference? Do you understand the difference between the two? I've spoken before about the danger of a Jesus and life. Jesus and my job. Jesus and my family. Jesus and this. Jesus and that. But I'm going to change that idea up a little bit today. I think there is a greater danger in having an and Jesus life. I have my career and Jesus. I have my family and Jesus. I have my softball team and Jesus. I have my church and Jesus. Do you see the problem here? Because the problem is when it's and Jesus, Jesus becomes secondary. Jesus is an add-on to your life. He is no more than seasoning. He's Lowry's seasoning salt on your life. He's garlic powder on your life. But if you are a Christ follower, Jesus must be primary. Jesus must be everything. And everything we do must flow from our life in and our love of Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Why would anyone do this? Why would anyone in their right mind want to die to self and take up their cross daily? Jesus continues, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. There's great benefit in dying to self. And it isn't just at the end of our life when we are in paradise. Serving God and serving others, loving God and loving others, it gives us great satisfaction. I mentioned the last two years I've been sponsoring this child through Compassion International. I get excited when I see just a short letter and a little drawing from him. I get incredible satisfaction when I go to the New Life Center and can spend an hour there, not even an hour, usually 45 minutes, serving a meal to these people that, that just need a little bit of extra help. There's great satisfaction in that. Trusting in Jesus also guides us. In my life, I've wanted to be a lot of things. I've wanted to be a meteorologist. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a politician. I wanted to be a music educator. I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to be a paramedic. At various points in my life, I wanted to be these things. But when you honestly surrender your life to God, when you die to self and Christ is truly able to live in you, God will guide you into something far greater. And it is through our life as believers that the world around us can see the glory of God. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. It is through our life that the world should see the glory of God. I think it came up in our class this week, or maybe I've heard it someplace else, or maybe I've said some iteration of this, but the truth is, sometimes the worst example of Christianity can come from a Christian. Sometimes the worst example of Christianity can come from a professing Christian. 
It is, at least in part, because we aren't totally committed to Jesus. What if, what if Jesus actually meant the things he said? What if Jesus actually meant to take up your cross daily? What if Jesus actually meant that we are supposed to die to self? What if Jesus actually meant that we are supposed to sell everything we own and give all that money to the poor? What if Jesus was serious? And what if we lived our lives the way Jesus tells us to? What if? Then, then we would be a great example to the world of the love of God. Then we would be a good example of the sacrifice of Christ. Abandon yourself. Abandon yourself and let Jesus take over. All the things we want, all the things we prefer, all the things that we think are right, let them go. Let them go and let God have control of your life. What do we say every week? God is in control. control. Let us live that out. Let us become the disciple whom Jesus loves. Die to your old self. Be born again in Christ Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. Because if you do that, it will benefit you in this life and in the next. Let's pray. Merciful God, thank you for this message. Lord, taking up our cross, dying to self, When it is I who no longer live, but you that lives in me, it is a hard thing to do. We struggle with this, Lord. God, help us to see what we need to do to fulfill this command to take up our cross daily. Remind us in those moments that we have, God, that we are the disciples that you love. Remind us, God, to show that love to those around us. Wherever we are, whatever the situation, help us to be that good example of your love to the world around us. Thank you for this message. Thank you for this day. All this we lift to you in that precious name of Christ Jesus.